for checking out Super Little Challenges. I'm Daniel Thomas and my guest today is Michael Kakowski. Michael is a performance and mindset coach who works with professionals to create harmony in their physical, mental and spiritual strength practices. We had an awesome chat about the concept of intuitive training, which is vital in helping us strive to reach our full potential. Thank you guys. All the best with whatever challenges you're facing, no matter how big or small they are. And enjoy this one. Have you always had an interest in particularly strength training from a young age, or um, always an interest in in movement and competition? I was, you know, like most coaches, played at athletics growing up, baseball, basketball, and uh, always enjoyed the training at, uh, part of it. And then really got into the understanding what fitness and personal training was when I actually had my own coaches. I hired a coach to help me with baseball and then had a good friend of mine who got me into the personal training world. And from there, I uh, just always, the one thing I always wanted to do is I knew I was going to be in a profession where I was working with people rather than things. I like to help people. So it was either going into like, medicine or law or something like that. And then really, really fell in love with the, the physical pieces of training. And then that just steered me into a lot of the mental side of training and strength and the spiritual side, and really the connection of all three together of working in. And, uh, that's mostly what I do now with clients is I really look at the whole, their whole life in general and say, okay, what are the mental practices? Where's the spiritual practice? Where's the strength practice? And kind of putting all those together to, you know, to make one complete program rather than just bits and pieces of it. Mm, it's it's a much more progressive approach. Um, I think you have there, which is looking at things as a whole rather than comp- compartmentalizing just the fitness aspect. It's just everything's so relative, isn't it? Yeah, I had a, I kind of had a personal epiphany of that a few years back um, that I can, I've shared on podcasts before of kind of a a difference in story. But I, uh, you know, around COVID time, I was, you know, so so back up a little bit. So I managed a club like a fitness center, general fitness center for about 10 years. And my passion on the physical side of training was hard style kettlebell work. I worked with Pavel Tatsulin and Strong First and RKC and loved that system of it. And was kind of, it was almost more of a passion project for a long time myself, because the place I was working with wasn't very interested in it. Then when I left there, a good friend of mine opened up a small studio, which was about 15 minutes from where I was living, specifically on this modality of training with hard style kettlebell training. And I joined him, we built up a studio and we were uh, exploding. We did amazing. And like so much so that we were tripling our space a week before the COVID lockdowns happened, we signed a new agreement. So we were expanding our space. We were expanding our expenses and growing. And when COVID happened, we built our entire system online, like in a weekend. We're like, okay, like all of the classes, everything we were doing in the studio, we're going to give to our members online as so many people had to pivot and transition. We took all of our kettlebells we had in the studio and we like pass them along. Like we, I would drive to people's houses and hand them a kettlebell, like Santa Claus, wow. like giving them <laughs> a, like a tool they can use while we're in this lockdown. Cause we didn't know how long it was going to happen. And at the time, like people were doing okay for a while, but slowly, but surely people started to fall off. They weren't coming to classes anymore. They were falling into depression. They were losing all the strength and the, the goals that they uh, achieved in the studio, were starting to fall back by the wayside. They were going to their old selves a lot. And I was talking with a lot of the members and asking about this. And one of the main responses I got was, well, if I'm not in front of you guys, I don't know. I'm, I'm not comfortable knowing what, to, what I'm supposed to do and stuff. And what I realized is I was already a dozen years of coaching, but when somebody was in front of me and I was telling them exactly what to do, they were doing fine. Like they were doing well. But as soon as I removed myself from the equation, they didn't learn anything. I was just a really good inst- like drill instructor, just telling mm-hmm. them what to do down the line. But as much as coaches, I think the main thing we want to do is we want to inspire others to take action and actually learn from us. So if something does happen, they know how to take care of themselves in this process of it. And I realized just the way that 
I was going about it was not was not working. So that made me really think much differently about coaching systems and how to coach people properly. What are the things that are missing from in general, like the fitness world and the fitness industry? And it led me to a lot of it comes into personal mindset about eliminating self-doubt, eliminating uh you know, the limited beliefs that we have about whether we can do this or not. And so often that's why I think people jump from one program to another in health and fitness all the time. Everybody's done it or have a friend who is the six week challenge guru. They do something for six weeks, they do great. And then they fall off again. And because, yeah, they're very good at following orders when they're motivated at that time. But what happens when life you know, just does what it does. You know, you get sick, you have family obligations, you have work things, you are just generally just not motivated or into it at the time. How do you still get through those times and still develop programs that you can still succeed in? So this becomes a staple of your life, not just a moment in time. So that's when about a few, a few years ago, that's really what changed a lot of my own mindset of training structure versus intuition and how I really approach talking to clients that I work with. What an amazing thing to come out of uh, that um, uncertain time, you know, the pivot, yeah. the massive pivot you guys did. Um, and then this whole kind of online world actually helping you have these realizations of how can we make people kind of self-sustainable in a way? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I know myself, it's like, I've had the kind of philosophy with classes in the past that just get yourself through the door, you know, just get yourself in. And then the kind of the instructor will, will, will get you through it. But like you're saying, um, you noticed people just started to, to drop off. That's just, yeah. that's, yeah, it's really interesting. Like if you're not there, literally, as you say, giving them that, those, those instructions there, how, how do people have this foundation where they can, um, self-motivate and, and, you know, be coached in that way. Right. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, it comes up a lot on the show. I, I I'm calling it a, a massive advocate for intuition. I, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> to me, intuition, um, and, listeners have heard me say it many times, but I can't say it enough really, because to me, it's, your, you know, <laughs> it's your, it's your North star, it's your compass, it's, it's, <laughs> it's your guide. And, uh, the more we, the more we exercise that, that it almost exercise it like a muscle, you know, in terms <laughs> of listening, listening to it, it, it tells us so much. And it's, it's by no means an easy thing to do, but I think it takes, it takes practice. Mm-hmm. So, so for you, what, what's your kind of, what well, call it definition about intuitive training and, and how big is that in your, your work? It's, oh, well, it's one of the biggest things, honestly. Um, I, I found it personally, I found it a few years ago when I was going into, when I started my own business, uh, my company breakthrough secrets, which is an art coaching business, um, with the strength connection. And at that time, I went through a lot of different transitions and pivoted a lot. And so in starting a business from scratch again, you're at, you know, you're at ground zero and you're building up, takes a lot of mental energy. It takes a lot of faculties, you know, throughout the day. So to have a very rigid or a very intense or structured training program at that time just didn't feel very aligned with where I was. So when I was working with my coach, we set up a plan where I was, I trained my body every single day, but I did it based on my own body's intuition. So there's a program uh, from two people that I've connected with before, Frankie Ferris and Adam Glass, who have been popularized the biofeedback solution, where essentially you're going to your body with a question rather than an answer. And if you can actually see there's science behind it that you can do specific range of motion tests or there's grip tests that is huge that tells you what your body is craving or what it needs at that moment. So I think it takes the piece of intuition out of kind of up here and like this, what is it like this almost metaphorical flight type thing of like, Mm. trust your gut, trust your intuition, actually bring it, brings it down into, yeah, no, it's actually tangible things that you can pull out of your body when you practice it a little bit at a time. You know, the grip tests are huge for athletes and athlete readiness. Um, If you take 
a kettlebell, if you take a 40 pound kettlebell and you pick it up every single day in your hand, your body's going to send you responses, whether that feels like it normally does, whether it feels really heavy or whether it feels really light for the day, your grip is a really good indicator of that. So based on intuition, that's something like a test that you can do to be like, oh, I'm feeling really strong today. This feels really light. That's a day where I'm going to push the intensity. You know, I call it the highway of strength. That's when we're going in the the fast lane and we're going a little bit quicker. Other days you might pick it up and it might feel like really heavy for a numerous amount of reasons. It might be, you know, you got bad sleep. You might be really mentally drained. It might just be just one of those days where you're not that strong. That's a day that maybe you're shifting more towards like the carpool lane, the cruise control lane. You're going a little bit slower or it feels somewhere in the middle and you're just kind of following the plan that you normally are at. So I think it takes the, my definition, I guess, of intuition is about being aligned being when your body and your mind is aligned together of what it needs. And when you say what it needs, I think just like anything, it's a skill that you need to develop. You know, if you right at the beginning, if you say, trust your gut to somebody who's a brand new beginner or intuition, they don't have that muscle developed. And, you know, I actually, um, you know, Daniel had, a, I did my own solo podcast episode of this of where I went wrong with teaching intuitive training mm. because it was working so well for me. I trained every day for six months, some days, 10, 15 minutes, short bouts. Other days I was felt really much better. And mentally I was so focused and mentally I was um, in it so I could do everything I needed to do for business. So I thought this was like the way to go. Everybody needs to do intuitive training. What I realized is people who are at a brand new beginning phase, if you're just starting something new, you need that structure. You need to follow that plan first. Eventually then once you get that down, I think it's a vital piece that you need to then go into your own intuition, your own creativity in a way, because that's, you know, you can stay with just blindly following a program, but I think you hit a ceiling a lot quicker than you think. And if you really want to continuously evolve, continuously, you know, develop yourself and be the strongest that you can, you need to take that knowledge and that structure and that discipline that you developed and play with it a little bit more outside. You know, I use the example like Michael Jordan, you know, like Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player ever, right? When he was in between the lines playing basketball, he could do anything. Like he created so many different things all the time. He probably trusted his intuition, but that was after he learned the out of bounds lines. He learned how to shoot a ball properly, know how to do the layup, like all the fundamental things he got so good at. And then once he got those, then you can play more from there. So I think it really is kind of a, it's a combination of both having that structure and then diving into intuition. And that's what I I think makes you the most formidable force of really developing your personal success and your personal strength. Man, that's so awesome because there's no, um, often this, like you say, this intuition stuff can get a little bit vague or to somebody Mm -hmm. who doesn't understand it, but to try and apply call it a template to the human condition it's just not necessarily gonna gonna be be the best given like you're saying how you feel how um how much we fluctuate as humans on a day-to-day basis in terms of um how we're feeling in all aspects of our Mm -hmm. mind and body so to to allow for that um like yeah you know like the words you're using awesome like play playing with it and, and bringing the create the creativity in it it's it's interesting because i'm a you know i'm call it a creative person filmmaking and writing and so on and mm-hmm. i have found exactly what you're saying is awesome for that as well in terms of having a structure but then allowing for the for the play yeah. um yeah it's really that's applicable in 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 so many things but but yeah, bringing creativity to your health and health and fitness is really cool. I'm I'm kind of rambling on, but um, yeah. the yeah, the thing about uh, you you know, I've 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 looked a little bit at some of these. I I can't rem- remember the name of the exercises where you lock your fingers and you try and sense mm-hmm. like get a, and I I struggled with that a lot. But but yeah. what but what you're saying makes a lot of sense in that if you're used to lifting say a kettlebell a certain way mm-hmm. and then you have you have this awareness and you're very attuned with what's going on 
you can really listen to that on a on a, on a daily basis and and adjust accordingly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, and I and I know what you mean about for people who are starting. I think just just getting that structure initially, but then moving more towards. Um, so I, I guess awareness is a massive part of it, right? <laughs> It is. And I mean, taking writing, for example, as you said, it's like you like where does create that's always a, an interesting question I've heard from writers when people ask, like, where do your ideas come from? And I think every writer hates that question because right, you really don't know what they are like. They just kind of come oftentimes maybe you have a specific environment that you put yourself in. And that's when you can get those theta brain waves to open up and you get those creative ideas. But if you go to things like Stephen Pressfield wrote in The War of Art or Turning Pro, it's like have a structure, like come to it every day and you're going to face the same things like over and over again. You'll still face resistance. You'll still face times when you feel like you don't have anything coming. But if you sit in it and you allow yourself to play with ideas so much. And I think what what happens sometimes is... I see it often in in the fitness world so much is everybody's always looking for the right thing to do. Is this the right thing to do? And it's kind of like if it's almost like writing if, when you start writing, like if the first draft oftentimes stinks, right? It's like you need to go, you need to just get the words out on paper and then you work on it and then you fine tune it and you tweak it. But you need to first do the work of just getting the the words down on the page and not worry about that. If you worried so much right away about every word in the first time you write it, you'll never write a book or you'll never write an article or nothing will ever come out. So I think it's it's the same thing many ways in how we approach strength and fitness is oftentimes the first thing to do is just do something. Like, you know, if you're just getting something down and then you build on that over and over again. You know, it's like, I'm more of a proponent of mastering a handful of like small exer- of like exercises to do that get your whole body together. That's why I did things like kettlebell training, because it's the whole body working at once. And you're working on a few movements and really trying to dial in the technique and the intensity and the volume of what you're doing. But you're not changing up the, the process every day. You're not trying to do a million different exercises and remember them. And that's where I think often we get wrong in in programming for ourselves. We're always looking for what's the right thing or the best thing to do. Mm. Well, if you're not doing anything at the time, the best thing to do is just something that you do, and then you can work it afterwards. And so that's where, you know, we vastly overestimate what we can accomplish in a year and grossly underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. Yes. You know, yeah. it's like, if you just do the things over and over again, just the consistency of doing something, then you have something to tweak and work with. You know, it's just like writing. If you don't have a draft to edit, then we'll just get that down first and then figure it out afterwards. And I think that really does. It's still the same thing of you need some structure and you need to then go in and you know, put your intuition into it, put your creativity and your play into what you just created. Consistency is a massive, massive thing. And yeah, mm-hmm. it, it is applicable. It's a great analogy with the writing because it's it's that that fear of just putting the word on the page can just cripple you from doing anything. Yeah. Um so to get I you know to get blank, com- a blank page is scary, right? <laughs> it's really scary. <laughs> it is. But to to get comfortable to get comfortable with the call it the, the vomit draft or whatever yeah. is uh is really yeah it's a, it's a huge thing but it again it, it it's really applicable because it goes back to like you said earlier it goes back to mindset mm-hmm. you know the the mindset can stop you from just putting pen pen to paper it can it can it can stop you from from lifting that mm-hmm. lifting that kettlebell kettlebell i think um I just think not to bring it to myself, but my example is a good one because I, I, uh, through COVID and so on, I started going to the gym and I was, I, I had the goal of, um, not, not putting on a lot of muscle mass, but getting more, uh, getting more, call it conditioning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was kind of making slow progress. And then I had like a, like a, a fitness check and my, my, um, my body fat was what I would consider high. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly I became determined to just shift everything to to cardio. So I, I sort of laid off the um the weights and just started running and swimming. Um 
And then just recently I had a six month fitness check after the initial one and the body fat percentage that I was looking at essentially hadn't shifted. Mm -hmm. And I was chatting to the, to, to the trainer and, and I, um, I was sort of joking in that, oh gosh, you know, how has this happened? But I'm not, I'm not going to give it up. Um, Mm -hmm. but we, we did start to talk about, um, variation and it was just a very short session, but we started to talk about variation and, and what I ha- you know, what you touched on earlier, sort of the, the, the quality of the exercise as opposed yeah. to trying to, trying to like, if I'm just ticking off X amount of reps and sets as yeah. opposed to trying to be very present and just focusing on doing a good, um, a good range of, of motion on the yep. exercise. Um, so I'm trying, I'm, I'm, uh, that that's really what I'm, the swimming and everything has been just as important for my, for my mind actually. Sure. So it hasn't, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's been so crucial, uh, for me in terms of, um, my mindset. So it yep. has benefited me no end, but just looking at that percentage number and not seeing it shift. Mm-hmm was causing is you know it's caused me a lot of confusion and i think i need to get some more uh some more guys some more um advice on sure that. <laughs> yeah well i mean yeah it's i mean when you look at body composition versus weight you know it's like you know cardiovascular work it's going to help you lose weight not necessarily help you lose fat um mm. you know that comes from there's a lot of different variables that come in, but adding strength training piece and getting that in for, you know, a few days during the week, that is going to hit body composition. So that muscle to fat ratio in a much different way from there. But what you said too, you know, Daniel, just about the mindset of something like swimming, um, of like cardiovascular work, you know, I, for, you know, a lot of people I know in the strength game who are strength coaches and the iron is, the best friend and you don't need anything else from there. Like, you know, the cardio cardio is just lifting the weights faster, you know, type Mm -hmm. stuff. That's not true either. It's like, there's, there's a component of cardiovascular work that is so good for a mental focus for just shifting and just getting away, you know, at that time, even just going for long bouts and walking, you know, it Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be something that is so, you know, highly intense where you need to go for a run or go for a really long swim, but just getting out and just going for a walk, um, out there, there's so many different benefits that you can get, but you know, you can, if you have a specific goal for like your body, like body composition, if you want to look a certain way, okay, there's some specific structures that you can do to follow that. And you can get to that point to sustain and maintain that forever and make that a part of you in there. That's when you'll get to like, okay, let's trust intuition. Like we need to go and play. And when I say intuition, it doesn't mean like you need to invent new exercises and stuff. It just means you need to listen to your body and get in tune with your body of what it's asking for more than anything. So I'll give an example. There's a lake that's by my house about like a mile away. And I go there often to just get a workout. And it's a great spot. It's very quiet in the morning and stuff. And I, I never go there like with a very specific plan. Like this is what I'm going to do. Like I'm going to do X amount of things forever. I just kind of go in, I walk around for a little bit and then I'm like, okay, this is what I feel like doing. I'm going to kettlebell snatch, you know, five reps on the minute for 20 minutes. That's like a go-to type workout, or I might try something else and stuff. That space and that environment for me is a way that I can get my strength work in, but also to connect a little bit more outside, be in a different environment. So it helps just as much for my mind and for my spiritual strength as much as anything. And I think when you do that, what you realize is the like the very like rigid structure of like exactly this many sets and this many reps of something to do starts to go off a little bit. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not discrediting that. I think I mean, there's huge value to that. And we need to understand those things of what is best for building muscle, what is the best for losing fat, what's the best for cardiovascular work, athletic performance, all those things. And I know millions of people that, you know, or not millions, but I know many, many, uh, friends who are in the strength and conditioning world of that, who have so much data and analytics, they are geniuses in that field. How I look at it is more of just living the most strong and most fulfilled life 
that you have for our general population is we get far too serious on the rigidity and the structure. And then we question whether this is the best method or not. When in reality, if you just get that structure down enough and then play inside of that structure, I think you're going to yield a lot more results. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. I, I like that idea of going to, going to the lake and, but being open, you know, you're mm-hmm. gonna, you know, you're gonna have call it a, a complete, a complete mind body workout in some way, yeah. but you're completely open to, 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 to what you feel when you get there. Well, what yeah. is it, what is it specifically about, uh, kettlebells? Why you're such a fan of them? Uh, so the tool in general, I think is so versatile. Um, one is, uh, you can use it anywhere. You can throw it in your car and go out to a lake and mm-hmm. get a full workout. And you don't have to have a full arsenal of a gym to get everything that you need to done. Um, it promotes really the flexibility and the strength together. So as I said, it's one of the most versatile tools that you can have. Um, for me, it was a bit of a path towards mastery. So, you know, I, my sport that I loved playing growing up mostly was baseball. Um, I was good at it and I really enjoyed it, but what always fascinated me with, uh, baseball is the intricacies and the details of like, just moving your arm a little bit one way or another, or just mm-hmm. shifting your weight and just everything is all attuned to swinging the bat and trying to hit the ball. But once you got that down, like everything was so individualized, like you could, it, it could take you know, a lifetime to master this one thing. And you see different ones that have done it, Shohei Otani and, uh, you know, Aaron Judge, these guys who are masters right now at it. And they're always fine tuning and they're always tweaking things, but they're not just changing things for the sake of changing things. You can see like when they shift their technique and their batting stance and stuff, like they know their body so well that they can feel those little adjustments. And I always thought that was so cool. I thought it was a different type of pursuit of physical excellence rather than just going to the gym and just getting a workout Mm -hmm. in. So for kettlebells, like, you know, in, in the strong first system, like the level one, we teach six movements, six total body exercises. There's the snatch, the clean, the press, the squat, the get up and, and the swing. And you go so into detail of the technique on all of those so much and everybody, you can just fine tune and just find a little bit better way to do something, shift your feet a little bit different and feel the strength change from there. Get a little bit more tension in your lower part of your body versus your upper part, get the snatch technique to flow a little bit faster on your wrist as you kind of flow. So all those little things, there's always something that you can work on and you can master. So it's kind of much more of like getting practice in and working on bettering a skill rather than just going to the, you know, going to the gym and just working out because you want to look good or you want to feel good. It's a deeper connection that I found in kettlebell training. And I know Mm -hmm. some people have found that with a tool like the barbell or found, you know, other, you know, or calisthenics work, gymnastics, those types, like there's all different ways that you can do it. The kettlebell for me, I thought was so powerful. And working with people on it. I love it because most people I work with are busy professionals. You know, they have, you know, high uh, pressure jobs and careers. They have families, they have a lot of time commitments. So to be able to be able to go home and in a seven by seven square foot space in their, you know, their basement or their living room or wherever it is, get a full body workout done in a short period of time then I know we're maximizing the time that we're, that we're using for them. Mm. Uh, it's very, very versatile. Just throw it in the car. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. Do you, do you take uh, this intuitive approach to into your nutrition as well? I do. Um, I nutrition is a <laughs> nutrition is a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> nutrition is a, it is a fickle world. It's in there. a whole, it, well, that's, that's what I'm, what I'm getting at. And it's a whole thing of its, yeah. thing of its own. Um, so I, I, um, personally, I, I actually follow more of a structure with nutrition. I usually have a very specific plan. I worked with a, a coach um, of mine, who's an amazing friend who worked with me for a while. We just, um, took a pause for a short period of time now, just from changing a couple of things up. But I was followed a, a pretty structured spot of like, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm you know eating because 
for me, that was a skill that I didn't want to have to think about and go into. Like I wanted to have more of a, a plan because that allows me to have some more creative energy into my training, mm. be uh, able to uh, be more creative in my business ventures that I'm doing, um, being able to be more open with my clients because I have more of a strict structure. So sometimes you have to pick your battles, you know, on that of like what you're doing, um, you know, strength, nutrition, accountability, like if everything is all going in the same direction, then that might be a little tough. I think sometimes it's very good to have one thing very structured and rigid down, you know, other things a little bit more free and a little mm-hmm. bit more open with stuff. So like last year I was, I followed a very specific training plan because I was going for a barbell program, a certification program. So I was following a pretty structured plan on that. Once that was over, I went more intuitive in my training, trying and kind of uh, working on a few different things. So nutrition stayed very rigid. Um, and I think, but to add on that, to to maybe help anybody that's listening on nutrition is it's a skill just like anything, you know, it's like, if you learn the skill of nutrition, which is, you know, what are calories made up? What are macronutrients? What are micronutrients? You know, and you actually just take some time to track what you're doing and actually understand like, okay, this is the amount of protein that works well for me. This is good for fats. This is good for carbs and do that for a period of time. I think that's a skill that so many people don't understand. Like we just eat the, uh, like how we eat, oh, we eat healthy and stuff like, and like that. And healthy is such a broad term that we have no idea what the heck that means. You know, and it's like, so for me, like working with people in nutrition, if I'm working with somebody on a plan, I'm like, okay, we're going to do, we're going to do this pretty rigid for a bit just to get these basics down. Once that opens up, then it's a lot more free to, you know, to do a lot more things because you built those skills up with nutrition, Mm -hmm. kind of going back to like the Michael Jordan reference, you know, it's like, Phil Jackson didn't need to like coach him as aggressively as other people. He had a little bit more open say because they were on the same page. He knew what he could do. He knew the skills that he had and he didn't need to like coach him. So like, no, you need to be in this spot on this play exactly Mm -hmm. here. No, you make it a little bit more open, but for nutrition, I would tell, I'd tell people like, no, like learn what, how much food that you're actually eating. Like most people, you'd be amazed at what you're actually eating when you start tracking everything that you do for the day, the little grabs here or there, like the, the glob of peanut butter versus actually what a serving size is and stuff like that. Like all that stuff Mm. adds up over time. So if anybody has really a body composition type goal on there, it's like, take the time just to learn that stuff. Yeah. The tracking of stuff is massive, massive seeing things visually uh, I found very, very beneficial. Yeah. I, I actually did it with alcohol a number of years ago. I, mm-hmm. I, I just, I actually just started to track when I considered, um, when I considered a night to kind of be too much. Uh, yeah. and then, and then I wasn't being too hard on myself. I was like, just cause I was putting check marks on a calendar and I was like, just look at those check marks and try and just try and reduce them. And then when I, when I, when I realized I was struggling a little bit to reduce them, I actually became more determined to, um, to, to, to really go at it. And then I, then, then I stopped drinking for, for a month and I haven't touched a drink in, in five years since, but uh, yeah, which is awesome. But it wasn't, it wasn't until exactly what you're saying that I started to track it. And then the same thing happened was with food. I was having some dietary issues and it wasn't mm-hmm. until I started uh, doing a kind of audit on, on what I was eating and seeing how that affected things. So yeah, I can't stress to, to listeners yeah. it, it, what you've just said, which yeah. is like to, to yeah. track stuff. It's well, monot- and you mentioned it, like use it as a challenge, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, do it for, you know, a month, do it for a block, but what I found from coaching people for 15 years is we are so much more capable than we give ourselves credit for of what we can mm-hmm. change. Okay. When we want to actually do something and really see the results from it, we can do a lot of really interesting things. You know, it's like with, you know, do something for six months, say it's like, okay, like I'm going to work out three days a week for the next six months and I am not going to miss a day. So I call it the non-negotiables. You know, it's like we have a plan, 
you know, we have like, this is the best result that we could possibly get, but then also like, what is the non-negotiable? So regardless of what time it is, regardless of what's going on in life, anything that's happening, I'm getting this done and you trust your own word and you do it. It's like, that is such a powerful thing that you can do for personal development and growth. And I've studied a lot of this. And I think one of the biggest things is we see it in nutrition a lot, but you see it overall in successes. It's this yo-yo success back and forth, right? You, you, you know, lose 15 pounds and you gain 12 back. Then you, you know, you lose 20, you gain 25. You go to the gym for, uh, you know, a month and then you're off for three. You go for six months and then you're off again for like two years. It's this back and forth type stop. And I think one of the big things at the beginning of starting the journey of that is because people don't trust their own word. They failed so often or they haven't done it before that that little voice in the back of the head says, no, I can't do this. And that's when like, when you see someone who is on a weight loss journey and they lose 10 pounds and somebody says, Hey man, you look great. It's awesome. Yeah, but I've got a long way to go. You know, it's like we dilute it down. Like we don't take the compliment because just face it. Yeah, exactly. And on the surface, it just sounds like, oh, we're keeping our eyes on the ultimate goal. But the little subconscious, you know, part of the brain is saying, I don't want to celebrate this because I'm afraid the other shoe is going to drop, you know, inevitably. And then we're going to go back because it's hard to look at yourself in a different light than who you are at the moment right now. You know, it's like to say, you know, if you never made a million dollars and to say, I'm going to make a million dollars this year, you have no idea what the hell that means. Like, you don't know what that is. You can't step into that at all. Um, so that's why in, people truly change when the the fear of staying the same is greater than the fear of making the change. Mm. So it's actually looking at where you're at right now being like, okay, I'm not comfortable where I am right now. That's going to propel you forward. But by doing it for like a challenge, be like, yeah, for six months, you know, I'm going to do this. Like you said, you did it for 30 days and then five years down the line, how quickly that five years is probably went, you know, in there at that time. So with challenge, like make it a challenge for yourself. Just be like, I'm going to see how strong I really am of following this. I haven't been consistent before, so I'm going to be ultra consistent. I am not going to miss a week of doing this. Mm. I, I bet, I bet money that you make that commitment on there, you can 100% do it. The non-negotiables are massive because it's, it's, it always amazes me how easily, even if you kind of lock yourself away, <laughs> your time can still be hijacked yeah. like very, very quickly. And, you know, the day can get away from you um, so rapidly without you doing very much at all because people want your time, there's things happening, like, you know, the, the live stuff gets in gets in the way, but, yeah, have those non-negotiables. Yeah. Um, and I think there's great reward when we prove it to ourselves. In, in, in the first series of this show, I did 50 small challenges mm. and some of them didn't kind of call it work out at all or I, or I, or I failed them not to, you know, I don't try not to use the word failure too much, but, um, they just didn't work out, but it was more about the consistency and the, and the proving to, to myself that I could do these little things consistently. And by the end of the, by the end of the 50, that consistency is what, what had the knock on it, mm -hmm. knock on effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was really, just really beneficial to take a tiny part of each day to devote to challenging, challenging, um, challenging myself for what you're saying. Take, take the challenge of, of, of stepping toward that, that little thing, whatever it may be. Yeah. And make it a rock solid thing too. Right. Like, and like I'm in the, I'm in the middle right now. We, I called it the August unplug challenge where 31 days, 30 minutes a day, with no phone, no watch, no computer, no book, no journal, nothing that is productive at all. Just a complete 30 minute time frame of just sitting in your own peace and quiet in mm -hmm. there. And because I realized of, you know, the times when you want to like be creative, they come from times of unproductivity. You know, it's like you need to put yourself into a boredom state almost in a way. So I'm like, all right. 
I'm going to do this challenge. I had a great conversation with uh, somebody I really admire on um, the Strength Connection podcast, and uh, they were talking about mellow yellow time and like blue sky time. And this is somebody who does a billion and a half different things, has a million entrepreneurial you know, spates, you know, uh, spaces around the world, keynote speaker, but also a father of three, you know, husband, like has a lot of different hats that he wears, still makes time for that complete unplug in there. And I think what we do so much and what I was doing is I have those times of self-care where I sit in quiet, but oftentimes I'm reading a book or I'm journaling. I'm like trying to make it a productive time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so no, I'm like, I'm not taking anything for productivity. Like I'm even trying in this time not to think about ideas of just to actually be as still as possible. So if I have ideas of things I want to do, I'm actually trying to bring those down <laughs> just as, just as a, a challenge, just yeah, to yeah. see what comes from it. And, um, you know, we're nine days in at the time, you know, from it. And some days have been, my mind's freaking racing a million and a half spots, you know, around. And I felt like there was like, there was no clarity at all. Other days got little moments of clarity in there. But what I said from that is it doesn't matter what the heck happens in this time. My only challenge is I'm going to do it. And so it's like, so I made it like concrete, like oh, my only obligation that I made to myself is to do this, whatever comes from it. I it's going to come like, it's going to happen from there. <laughs> And I think if people take that approach more to health and fitness and their strength of, I'm just going to do it. I don't even, I'm not even going to look at the results of it. You know, if I go on a diet for a week and I don't lose a pound this week, I'm not failing. Like I did the diet. I followed it. That's the victory right there. So that's all you're challenging yourself with. That's all you're doing is just following the plan, just doing what you said. If you do that, the results come, you know, they come on their own timetable, but they are always coming. You know, it's like, you know, I, I study a lot of the Tao Te Ching, you know, and they use nature and observe that all the time. And it's like, you look at it of, you know, a tree, you know, the first thing a tree does is it grows the roots down. Right. So on the surface, as you look at it, it looks like it's not doing anything. It's not growing at all, but it's growing the roots underneath. It's not looking at its buddy tree next to it and saying, well, he's growing really fast. Why am I not growing yet? It's just on its own timetable. It's growing the roots the way that it needs. As soon as it's ready, then it pops up and it sprouts and then it grows into a hundred tall, hundred foot tall, you know, towering, you know, tower of strength right there. But it does it on its timetable. It just does the work every day. You know, and I think that's an example that we can use. That August unplugged is an awesome challenge. I'm going to I'm going to have a crack at that. Um, I love the idea of like <laughs> not even allowing the ideas, like just, you know, that that's a real yeah. challenge because yeah. you, you're, you're essentially trying to give yourself that space to then, and it's, it's counterintuitive to what a lot of society says. And especially in this very noisy mm -hmm. um, information overload, uh, that we're in currently to it's hard to take half an hour to re, to to do that but i i can i can really see the, the potential benefit in that so um yeah yeah there's normally i normally ask guests to suggest a challenge for the listeners you've suggested a number of them already which is <laughs> fantastic so um yeah uh, that, that one's, that one's a really, really cool one for anyone. That, that one's an easy, that one's interesting. You know, it's, I mean, it's the, it's the old Carl Jung quote of like, you know, people will do anything regardless of how absurd to absurd to avoid facing their own soul. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, I think that's it. It's, I, I think it's not, it's not so much that it's difficult. It's that being with yourself and your own mind with your own thoughts without berating yourself and self-criticizing yourself is a, is a big challenge, you know, or, it's or, like, or distracting yourself or distracting it. yourself or numbing, exactly. or numbing yourself or yeah. And, and yeah. how fun it is and how easy it is that we can numb ourselves from anything that we have to do at that time. And but when you actually do that and you actually sit by yourself with it and just, just be, just mm -hmm. actually just sit and just be like, it's, it's powerful. It's not comfortable. Like it's, it's a very, it's uncomfortable. Like not sitting, like, that's why I say I'm like, 
I don't do these challenges like that and just be like, oh my God, I've been three days and I feel freaking great. It's like, no, like I just was berating myself for the last 25 minutes of the 30 about things that I didn't do or people I forgot to get back to and where is this going and should I scrap <laughs> this and stuff? And you're like, okay, I'm catching these and you're trying to clear it out, but they just come at you as fast as possible. It's mm. like, okay. And then the alarm goes off and I was like, okay, I did it. I got it done. Okay. Now you can go do what you need to do now. Yeah. To see like, yeah, my mind is the same. It would be, it would be, yeah, but you need to do this for something that's going to happen three months from now. So you, you can't sit here for half an hour. And if, <laughs> if you, if you don't, if you don't do something that, you know, do anything right now, exactly. it's, it's really, really crazy. I, um, I mentioned it before, but I just, I watched a series recently on Netflix quarterbacks. So I'm not, I'm not interested yeah. in, I'm not sure if you've seen it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, yeah, I watched it. It was interesting. Yeah, just just the fact that the uh, the Minnesota guy uh, Cousins um, demanded to have that Tuesday off. I thought that was brilliant yeah. because for a star quarterback um, to say, "Hey, guys, I want I want my Tuesdays free with nothing to do with football." Yeah, would seem they'd be like, "What are you talking about?" You know, the the amount that those guys have to do in preparation for the next game, in terms of the the plays, oh, yeah. ev everything they have to do. I don't, you know, to ha to even find that space in the week is crazy. But that for him, that was the not non negotiable for his family time and and going to the bookstore, and he essentially does nothing associated with football. And you you can you can see the benefit, I think. Oh, it's huge. And that was, it was an interesting thing to see the inside. And he was doing like some of those things, like with the mind like mm. strap and watching the things. And so I think, you know, for him, you can see how hard he works on the other six days of what he's doing. So it's like, I don't think anybody in Minnesota had any issue with him being like, yeah, Kurt, go take Tuesday off. We'll see you on Wednesday on there. Because he knew that was a time that he's not just a football player. You know, he's a husband, he's a father, he's Kirk, like he's a guy, like, and he wants to be other parts of it as well. And he needs that in order to actually be the best that he can as the quarterback. He needs that day. That's just as vital as all the work and all the preparation as part of it. And I was, I heard this story a long time ago of uh, Teddy Roosevelt when he was president and he would take like month long excursions on like hunting and nobody knew where he was. He would just go out and hunt while he's in office, like as a president of the United States, he went for a month and people didn't know he came back. The country was running. OK, like it was fine. And I just always thought I was like, wow, if the president can take a month off, hmm. I can I can take 30 minutes a day away from stuff. There's not yeah. that much going on in your life, <laughs> yes. you know? And I think it's like, we do, we, cause we're so connected all the time with stuff that we think that everything needs to go a certain way, or we're missing something. And it's like every moment we need to be, you know, connected. So like to take that day off for, you know, for cousins or people, oh my God, to take a full day off. Like I could never do that. Well, the people that would really ask that, I'd be like, well, what are you doing on the other days? Because I bet there's a bunch of time that you're not doing anything, that you're just you're just diluting your brain out of watching something on there, like throughout the rest of the days in there. And yeah. then you're doing like two hours of like actual work where yeah. that guy, it's like, yeah, he's he's focused in for 12 hours a day mm. in there. And then he takes his time that he needs. And but probably in that, I would you know, assume kind of going back to our conversation of tuition, I bet there was a moment with him where he wasn't doing that, where he trusted his own gut to be like, yeah, you know what? I need Tuesdays off. Like I need this full day, probably not knowing whether that was going to be a great thing for him or not. But he's like, this is an idea I'm going to go into. I'm going to trust it. And then it seemed like it was working out really well for him at that time. So I think like, you know, you could take an example, like a guy like him where, yeah, he got the structure down. He got all the tools of what got him to where he needed to be. Then he started to be more creative with it. Where else can I really, where else do I need to put my energy and my focus so I can be the best person that I can be? Okay. One of those is I need to take this day with my family. And that was a non-negotiable. And it's like, so yeah, it's, there's great examples around all of it of like connecting these two things together, that structure versus intuition. I think that's another really interesting one.
Mm, no, definitely. The intuitive thing, I, I, I just, I love it. It's f- fascinating. Um, where can people find you? Uh, so you can check out, uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram uh, for social media. Uh, if you just go Michael Kurkowski, um, you'll find me there. Uh, I have the podcast, the Strength Connection podcast, which I do, where I connect with a lot of people in strength, share stories on there. So you can check that out. And if you go to if you go to mystrengthconnection.com, all one word, uh, from there, I'll give a link that uh, if people really want to dive into the intuitive training piece of it, I have a free ebook on there called the One Day Strength Challenge. And this is taking one day a week into your program and bringing an intuitive approach to it and how to do that and how to use my analogy of the highway of strength to break it down and work that in. So that's a free gift that I'll put out to anybody who wants to who listens to this and um, wants to uh, check out more intuitive training. Oh, that's another, that's another challenge right there. That is, that yeah. is, I'm all about the challenge. Yeah. I love the challenges. <laughs> we might have to do another one in time. Um, Cause sure. it seems, it seems there's an, a number of challenges we can, we can go down now, but thank Thank you so much. It's been uh, my really, pleasure. Yeah. Really insightful. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.